The Mountaineers did what they needed to do and came out with a 56 to 17 victory over the Duquesne Dukes in game two of the 2023 season. They now have an even record of one and one. What can be taken away from this game, if anything, and what are my thoughts as they get ready for the backyard brawl coming up this Saturday? Pull up a chair, sit back, relax, and we're going to talk about it right after this word from our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Dutch Miller Automotive, where friends and family pricing means you get the best deal right up front on any new or pre-loved vehicle in stock every time. With brands like Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GMC, Buick, and Subaru, the Dutch Miller Automotive family is always growing and ready to put you in the car or truck you've been searching for. Check out our inventory across West Virginia at DutchMillerAuto.com or come in today to the home of friends and family pricing only at a Dutch Miller Automotive store near you. What is up, college sports fans, Big 12 fans, fellow members of Mountaineer Nation? Welcome in to another edition of Coos's Corner. Grab yourself a bar stool and belly up to the bar and let me pour you out this shot of top shelf college football content. On tap at Coos's Corner today, we are talking about the takeaways from the 56 to 17 victory over the Duquesne Dukes, West Virginia's lone FCS opponent on the year. Now, I'm going to talk about the positives and negatives and then, you know, what we have to look forward to for next week. Today, I'm going to switch it up a little bit and we're going to talk about the negatives first and get those out of the way and then we'll focus on the positives. The negatives, first on the offensive side of the ball, the number one concern I have right now on that side of the ball is the drop passes. We saw Cortez Braham, we saw Jeremiah Aaron, we saw Preston Fox all drop balls yesterday. Now, I do want these guys to be held accountable for that, but at the same time, and and, and I, I'm not going to lie, I was calling for those guys to be pulled and benched during the game. But when you sit back and reflect on it, maybe that's not the right move. You know, you've got to give these guys a chance to play through that. Hopefully they can work through it, get out of that funk that they're in. Most of it's probably mental, if not all of it, because I know these guys know how to catch football or they wouldn't be where they are. And the last thing you want to do is ruin a wide receiver's confidence. Now, if it continues, you obviously have to put somebody else in the game. I get that. But right now, maybe you need to stick with these guys, give them more chances to make plays. All it will take was for one of these guys to step up and make a really big play. They can get their confidence back and, you know, contribute to this football team in a very positive way. You know, I, I played wide receiver in high school, and, I, you know, I, I had several times where I dropped passes. I dropped touchdown passes. I dropped balls I should have caught. And it gets in your head, man. It can ruin your confidence. Uh, the only way I was able to get my confidence back, number one, I worked on my hands, my concentration. And number two, I, I finally had a chance to make a big play. I made a big play. The whole team rallied around me and got my confidence back. And next thing you know, I had pretty good hands going forward because I just had to prove to myself I could do it. And once these guys get a chance to do that, you could see them flip and turn around. But it's like I said, at the same time, if they don't, then you've got to put guys in the game who will, right, who will make those plays like. Hudson Clement, who I'll talk about later. So the drops is my number one concern. Uh, but we got to keep in mind, too, Devin Carter did not play in the game. You know, so our number one receiver was out. He he, had, he was a little banged up. Traylon Ray didn't play in the game. You know, and he they said he's looked really good in camp, and he, he has good hands. He was out injury with an injury as well. So two of our top receivers didn't play in the game. Once we get those guys, those guys back, hopefully it'll help with the consistency in, in catching the football. Second biggest concern, I would say, would be Garrett Green and his intermediate and short throws. Now, my buddy Paul and I have a little bit of a disagreement on this. He's a lot more concerned about it than I am because I think they'll get it fixed. I'll harken back to the 2016 season, I think it was, or even 2015, when we had Skylar Howard at quarterback. And I used to complain all the time about how Skylar Howard missed short and intermediate throws. But, man, on the long ball, he was money. And they ended up winning 10 games in the 2016 season because they were able to utilize Skyler's legs, the running game, and then they would make, you know, throw deep shots when they needed to with people like Shelton Gibson. Now, right now, this team doesn't have a receiver that's went out and proved themselves like a Shelton Gibson did back then. We don't have that guy yet. Now, I think we have some guys that are capable of being that guy. E.J. Horton, another guy who's been out the first two games of the season. He's the transfer we got from Marshall. They say he's the fastest guy in that receiving core. He's a deep, he, he could be our deep threat. Maybe when he comes back in the fold, it gives us that guy. Maybe Devin Carter can be that guy, even though he probably don't have Shelton speed. But nonetheless, you see where I'm going with this. We need that guy who they can take the top off with. Did they find the guy in Clement? We'll see if he can do that against tougher competition. But Garrett has missed on a lot of short and intermediate throws. 
And now if he can fix that, and I asked him in a post-game press conference, and he says it's just a matter of concentration, keeping your mechanics right, and, and you know, focusing on or paying attention to detail. Hopefully he can get that right for this weekend's game against Pitt. And I think he can. I really think he can. I have faith in Garrett that he will. I'm sure Garrett is can do that or that he wouldn't be where he's at now. So uh, I'm looking forward to him correcting that. And, and you know, he did have a, some good throws yesterday. He hit Preston Fox on a kind of a seam route for a touchdown. That was a really good throw. That wasn't, you know, it wasn't a deep ball necessarily. But he also missed on a few as well. Now, his stats would have been even better had there not been as many drops. But, but again, he did miss some throws I'm sure he'd like to have back. So, you know, that is one concern I have. Now, defensively, the concerns I have, and probably my biggest concern on this entire team is the secondary. They still were allowing guys to get open, and against a team like Duquesne, that should not be happening. There were too many guys open downfield. Coach Brown even addressed it in his postgame press conference, talked about how it's a huge concern for him as well. And then I was listening to the Country Roads Confidential podcast with Mike Casaza and Chris Anderson this morning, and they brought up something I hadn't really thought about much, and that's the lack of depth back there. Even though the guys on the field haven't really been performing up to standard, there's nobody else to put in unless you put in true freshmen. Uh, you know, Jacoby Spells still is not playing a lot of snaps for whatever reason. I guess the staff feels he's just not ready yet. Last night they relied on Malachi Ruffin, who's a former walk-on. They relied on Andrew Wilson Lamp, who's just now really getting, you know, he's just now becoming the starter. So he doesn't have a ton of experience. And they're relying on Beanie Bishop, who's obviously the transfer from Minnesota. Now, Beanie did have a pick in the game which, you know, made up for the two drop picks he had against Penn State. So, hopefully that will help his confidence going forward. And then, obviously, you know, back up Avery Wilcox had a pick in the second half as well when they had the, the second and third stringers in the game. So, I was happy to see that. But at the same time, I would like to see better coverage downfield, especially against a team like Duquesne. So, that is a concern. Because, and especially uh, another concern, you know, what if one of these guys get hurt? You know, Montre Miller, the transfer from Kent State, he's already hurt. He missed last night's game with an injury. And Nick Brown says he don't he don't he don't know how long he'll be out. He could be out a while. So if if one of these starters do go down, you've got Jacoby Spells there, and then after that, I think you've got a bunch of freshmen, is my understanding, or maybe some walk-ons. So we are really thin in the secondary, just like we were a year ago. And the guys that are in there have got to step their game up. Uh, now I I feel like they can. Now will they? It, it's you know another that will be that will be determined here here before long. Now one way you might be able to offset that is, uh, and, I, and this is where I'm going to go into the positives now, I'm going to go ahead and start here because it, it's a good segue, but on the defensive side of the ball, I really like our front seven. I feel like our D-line and the linebackers have played really well the first two games. They, they've created a lot of havoc in there. I mean, Tommy Wad, DeRogier, the, the freshman transfer from Kentucky, he has two and a half sacks in two games, and I don't, I mean, I know he only played 10 snaps against Penn State. I'm not sure how many he played against Duquesne, but it wasn't, you know, he didn't start, didn't play a ton of snaps. And he already has two and a half sacks. So I'm really, I'm really excited about this young man. Sean Martin's been playing well. I feel like our nose guards have been playing well. Uh, I really like what we're seeing up front. Obviously, Lee Cove has played well. Trey Lathan, I've been real impressed with how Trey Lath Lathan has played as a redshirt freshman this year or, or a sophomore, whatever, whatever he is. But, you know, his first year as a starter, came in with very little experience, and he's played really well. The moment has not been too big for him. Uh, and I think his future is really bright. So I really like what we have. In our front seven, Jared Bartlett had a good game against Duquesne. He had a sack. So I really like our front seven and, and, and where they're at right now. Obviously, they can get better and continue to improve. But what's going to have to happen is hopefully that front seven can continue to play the way they are and, and get even better because if they can get more pressure on the quarterback going forward, you know, because every opponent we have going forward is a power five team. We have Pitt, and then we go into our Big 12 schedule. This front seven, in order to offset the weaknesses in the secondary, they have got to get a lot of pressure on, on opposing quarterbacks because if they can do that, it, it, our DBs won't have to cover as long and the weaknesses won't be as exposed as much. So our front seven needs to create a lot of havoc and bring a lot of pressure on quarterbacks so that these teams cannot beat us with their arm like Penn State did and like Duquesne tried to do. As you look here at the team stats, you'll go down and look, look at this rushing yards on defense. Duquesne had three rushing yards in this game, three. And I know they're an FCS team, guys, but teams can almost get three rushing yards by accident. I mean, 0.1 yards per carry. I mean, three rushing yards is, is phenomenal. 
for an entire game. And you look, conversely, on our side of the ball, West Virginia rushed for 304. So that is a strength of this defense for sure is stopping the run. They did a pretty decent job against Penn State, against those two running backs. And they did an excellent job against Duquesne stopping the run. They are forcing teams to be one-dimensional, or at least they did against Duquesne. The problem is our secondary has has allowed some big plays. Now, that still, in my opinion, is still good that you're forcing these teams to be one-dimensional. It's going to make it a lot easier for the defensive staff to scheme. They can get more aggressive, bring more pressure if they need to, to help create some of that havoc I talked about. As long as you can stop the run like this, it will open up so many things for your defensive game plan that should help, like I said, offset some of your struggles in the secondary. So I'm really impressed by that rushing defense that West Virginia has been able to show you thus far. Now, also on the defensive side, the two turnovers, the two interceptions I mentioned, big positives, big things that these guys can take away to help build their confidence going forward because we all know West Virginia only had four picks the entire season of last year. They already have two this year in one game, so that's a positive as well. And again, a pretty clean game, only four penalties for West Virginia on the day. Now, let's look at the positives on the offensive side of the ball. 619 yards of total offense, first of all. That's really good. I don't care who the opponent is. And then 315 yards passing and 304 rushing. So really good balance there. 17 of 32 through the air between Green and Marchio. 9.8 yards per pass, which is close to that 10 number, which is where they really need to be, in my opinion. They were only averaging six yards per pass against Penn State. And that's about what Garrett Green averaged a year ago, too. And that's not going to get it done, folks. You cannot win a lot of games averaging only six yards per pass attempt. So it was really good to see Garrett throw some deep shots, and even Nico, for that matter, in this game. I wish Nico would have gotten a few more opportunities to throw the deep ball, but I was glad he at least got in there to throw throw a few. Um, obviously, you know, sticking with Garrett, I mean, his his stats were really good in this game. I was really pleased with how he played. He was really able to show off his arm, which a lot of people were kind of doubting, you know which I thought was really ridiculous because anybody who's watched Garrett Green on film or any highlights or anything knows he's got a cannon for an arm. It's it's his accuracy that's that's kind of in question at the moment on the shorter stuff. But Garrett was 10 of 18, 240 yards, four touchdowns, three of those obviously to Hudson Clement and then the one to Preston Fox. Had a QBR of 65.3, but his QB rating in the game was like 249 or something. So an excellent, excellent quarterback rating in this game for Garrett. on the. Uh, rushing leader on the day was Jaheim White, who played with the second unit, had a great day. 12 carries, 110 yards, 9.2 yards per carry, and a touchdown. Uh, C.J. Donaldson carried the ball 13 times, only 56 yards, 4.3 yards per carry. I would have liked to have seen him get more yards, but, uh, again, I'm not sure if that's on him or the offensive line. I'd have to go back and watch it again. Uh, maybe the line didn't get as much push as they should have early. But, you know, the team came out slow, guys, in this game. You know, for whatever reason, I don't know if they were just lackadaisical, maybe looking ahead to Pitt, whatever the reason. Then they had the lightning delay. Obviously, the team come out and looked like a totally different football team. So, uh, the offensive line, just in my opinion, wasn't getting the push they should have gotten early on. But, but, but I, I have full faith in this offensive line. They're really, really good. Jaron Anderson obviously had four carries for 38 yards, and then DJ Oliver, the other backup freshman, got 10 carries for 38 yards. And then Hudson Clement, the story of the day. Five catches, 177 yards, three touchdowns, 35.4 yards per reception. His long was that 70-yard touchdown, which I think was the second one of the game, maybe the third one, I can't remember. But nonetheless, he had two two, two deep touchdown passes, and then the shorter one was his first one. Uh, but just a really good day for Hudson Clement, kind of really broke out. He kept becoming a breakout star, earned himself a scholarship after the game. He was awarded a scholarship after the game in the locker room, so kudos to Hudson Clement the West Virginia native, former Gatorade Player of the Year in the state from Martinsburg High School. Cole Taylor, the tight end, they continue to get him involved in the offense. He caught three passes for 55 yards, 18.3 yards per catch. They actually targeted him a few more times, but they were they missed on, on some throws there. Preston Fox had a couple catches, did have the one touchdown. Uh, but he also had that drop early in the game. It's his second week with a drop, but we all know Preston Fox has been shorthanded in his career thus far. So I feel like he'll get it fixed. I'm not really worried about him going forward. Uh, the two that I am concerned a little bit about are Cortez Braham and Jeremiah Aaron. Jeremiah Aaron had two drops in this game, if I recall. One when Nico was in the game, one when Garrett was in the game, and then Braham had another drop second week in a row. Uh, we're going to need Cortez to step up and become that number two receiver, if not the number one receiver on this team. 
Uh, and in the two turnovers, kind of fluky. Jacoby Spells had the ball bounce off of him uh, for the fumble on the punt where he didn't get out of the way. Coach Brown put a lot of that on Preston Fox for not being aggressive enough on the point to tell him to move out of the way. And then obviously Rodney Gallagher had kind of Rodney Gallagher, Rodney Gallagher kind of had that fluke fumble when he was trying to stretch out and stretch the ball into the end zone and it fun and he fumbled it. So but I was proud of Rodney though before that. He made a really good play, caught the pass on the screen, ran 12 yards. And uh, you know, he should have just ran out of bounds there or just took the hit instead of trying to stretch the ball out. But nonetheless, you know, we're going to see a lot of big plays from Rodney Gallagher in his West Virginia career. So I'm not real worried about it. But uh, so yeah, the big positives on offense, you know, Garrett Green had a good day throwing the football, especially on the deep throws. Uh, Hudson Clement stepped up and got the start for Devin Carter, who was out banged up. Five catches, 177, three TDs. Great game for him. Could he end up stepping in and becoming a starter on this team? Time will tell. Uh, we really need somebody to step up and be that number two guy behind Devin Carter. Maybe he's it. You know, I don't know. And then the running game was was good again, led by Jaheim White, who I felt had a great day and probably earned himself some snaps in the backyard brawl next week. I want to hear your guys' thoughts as what you thought the strengths and weaknesses were of this team or the positives and the negatives, however you want to call it. Uh, interesting note for those of you who may not have heard Neil's postgame press conference, Chad Scott actually called the plays in the second half of this game. He wanted to give him, I guess he wanted to give him that experience. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. But I want to hear your all's thoughts on the game as well. Now, moving forward uh, against Pitt, I haven't had a chance to break down Pitt yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a completely separate video on that. I'll actually probably do multiple videos on Pitt. I plan on collaborating with J.J. Kitchen again this year. He has his own channel called Talking College Football with J.J. Kitchen. He's a Pitt fan. Uh, he and I are going to collaborate and do a preview video together to talk about the game, kind of what to look for with each team, strengths, weaknesses, matchups, things like that. And I'll also do my own game preview. But going at, you know, we all know Pitt lost the game. They lost our game yesterday to Cincinnati, 27-21. Uh, according to what I've seen on social media, their quarterback, Phil Dracovic, did not look very good. I think he's struggling so far this year a little bit. Fans were even booing him yesterday is, is my understanding. So, you know, but what concerns me about this pit game is the fact that them losing the game, will they come in? They're going to come into this game pissed off, and they're going to have something to prove. So that concerns me a little bit. You know, you would rather them come in uh, a little overconfident. That's not going to happen with Pitt after coming off a loss. But I'm sure Narduzzi will have them ready to go. But, you know, but that being said, in a rivalry game, do you really need anything to get you fired up for a rivalry game? Probably not, so I don't know that it really matters. But that is one concern I have. I am glad that West Virginia was able to get a, get one in the win column, even though it was against an FCS opponent. Like I've said before in past videos, to me, these first two games, you had the Penn State game, which almost nobody expected us to win. You had the, the game against Duquesne, which everybody expected us to win. We're one in one of those games. You start right now to me, the season starts now. You start zero and zero, brand new season. And this right here, this pit game, and I, I've heard a lot of members of the West Virginia media talk about this. This is the most important game, arguably, in the Neil Brown era. This game right here could tell us the direction this season is going to go, this game against Pitt. If West Virginia can win this game, it you know, there'll be a lot of positives. They'll have, obviously, a victory over their arch rival. It'll be Neil Brown's biggest victory since he's been here. It, you know, it'll be something that can they can take with them and help them build confidence the rest of the season. And it will make the fan base hopefully feel a little bit better about Neil as a coach and about this team. Let's face it, there's a lot of negativity surrounding the program right now, and rightfully so. Rightfully so. Everybody's concerned. It's, you know, the worst four-year period in West Virginia football since the late 70s. So we're not hiding from that. That's real. That's where we are. So that Neil needs this win desperately. The team needs this win desperately. And the fan base needs this win desperately. So this is a big game. This is a huge game coming up on September 16th with the Backyard Brawl. I'll, you know, I'm excited about it. I'm planning on being in attendance at the game. I can't wait. I'm fired up and ready to go. Saturday can't get here soon enough. And then one last thing I want to touch on, you want to talk about Vegas knowing what the heck they're talking about? The spread on this West Virginia-Duquesne game was 38 and a half. West Virginia won, won by 39. Just absolute – I mean. I don't know how Vegas does it, how these their analysts do it or whatever they're called there in Vegas. They're bookmakers, I guess. But, man, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> so it couldn't have gotten much closer. But nonetheless, guys, I want to hear your comments below. Please drop your comments. Share and like this video. Like is a thumbs up right below. Be sure to hit that if you like this content. 
guys, if you want to support what I'm doing here on the channel a little bit, you want to donate a little bit of money here, you can do that and make a one-time donation. There's a heart with a dollar sign. You can hit that button, leave a comment. It's it's basically a super chat, but it's not it's just not on a live video. You can become a member at Coos's Corner, become a member of the VIP club. You can see my pub level member scrolling across the bottom of the screen right now. That's the $2.99 a month level. There's also the club level, which is a $4.99 a month. You get a few extra perks with that level. So shout out to all those members. And guys, don't forget, if you're a new member or you're an older member who has yet to do so, send me your mailing address to coos.walker at gmail.com. That's my email. And I will send you one of these, a free drink koozie for my channel members who have yet to send me their address. For those of you who have, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you're using it. I know Browns and Beers sent me a photo of his yesterday. He was using it at his tailgate. So shout out to Browns and Beers for supporting me and for showing off my, uh, you know, promoting my channel there at the tailgate there in Morgantown. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to meet you, meet you next week. With that being said, guys, thanks for everything you do. Thanks for your support. Please continue to support me here. And uh, I look forward to bringing you more content this week regarding the Backyard Brawl. So be on the lookout for that. With all that being said, thanks for tuning in. Q Country Roads. Oh.